There are a couple of errors that people make when they think about wisdom and knowledge. On the one side is anti-Christian intellectualism. The, the idea that the pursuit of knowledge is antithetical to the pursuit of Christ. On the other end, there is anti-intellectual Christianity. Anti-intellectual Christianity finds itself to be more spiritual to the degree that it stays away from all of those technologies, all of those new things that are out there. In fact, there are some sects of people in different parts of the world who, who won't use an automobile, who won't have a television, who won't use a telephone because those technologies are worldly technologies. And there is a ditch on both sides of the road. There is a proper way for us to think about wisdom and knowledge. And it starts with knowing and understanding the limits of wisdom and knowledge. From our text, first, acquiring knowledge and wisdom is good and necessary. Look at verses 12 and 13. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Now, the language that he uses there, poetic language, right? He applied his heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. In other words, he wanted to know everything that he could possibly know. He says it is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man. Let's, let's forget the unhappy business part for a moment. But he says a, a business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. God intends for people to seek wisdom and knowledge. God does not intend for his people to be anti-intellectual. So regardless of what we find here, and regardless of what he's saying about, you know, striving after the wind and so on and so forth, he's not saying that it's wrong to seek wisdom and knowledge. In fact, Solomon was famous for his knowledge. Look at 1 Kings chapter 10. 1 Kings chapter 10. Now the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. She came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. Now. Oftentimes, we, we, we err at this point. And at this point, we say that what was happening with Solomon and the reason that people were coming from all over the world to meet with Solomon and to talk with Solomon is because Solomon was just endowed with supernatural intellect. Well, when you read Ecclesiastes, what does he say? He devoted his heart to searching out everything was wise and knowledgeable because he was a relentless student. He was relentless in studying everything he could get his hands on. Architecture, agriculture, science, math, medicine, everything he could get his hands on. That's why people came. Not because he just fell out of the womb quoting algebra equations. Verse 4, And when the Queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings, 
that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. And she said to the king, the report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom. But I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told to me. Your wisdom and your prosperity surpass the reports that I heard. Happy are your men. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, he has made you king that you may execute justice and righteousness. So this is the business that God has given to the children of man. To seek out wisdom. To seek out knowledge. Don't let this text fool you into believing that we're being called to somehow be anti-intellectual because we're talking about the limits of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible speaks favorably about acquiring knowledge. Psalm 19, 1 and 2. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals his knowledge. There is knowledge in creation that we are called to pursue. It's interesting, you know, my, my children are always asking questions. You know, why, why do I have to do this? And why do I have to do that? And, you know, why, why, why do I have to go to school? And why do I have to study this? And why do I have to study that? Psalm 19, 1 and 2. The heavens are declaring the glory of God. Why do you need math and science? You need math and science because God reveals himself in two books. He reveals himself in the book of scripture, but he also reveals himself in the book of nature. He reveals himself in his handiwork. And so we pursue a greater knowledge of the world that God has created so that we can know the God who created the world. Proverbs 4 and 5, get wisdom, get insight, do not forget, and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Proverbs 4, 7, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, and whatever you get, get insight. Proverbs 16, 16, how much better to get wisdom than gold? To get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. It is a good thing. To pursue wisdom and knowledge. Christians have always, by the way, led the way in the pursuit of, Christ, of, of uh, wisdom and knowledge. L listen to this. In Grotheus' book, Christian Apologetics. As part of a long and fascinating research project concerning the relationship of Christian monotheism to Western history. Sociologist Rodney Stark claims that the medieval Christian worldview provided a wellspring of intellectual resources for the development of science, technology, and commerce. He argues that the later achievements of the scientific revolution were not the result of an eruption of secular thinking, but were the culmination of many centuries of systematic progress by medieval scholastics sustained by that uniquely Christian 12th century invention, the university. Yes, my friends, Christians invented universities. Not Muslims, not secular atheists. Christians invented universities. We are not and have never been anti-intellectual. Failure to pursue knowledge in scripture is viewed as folly. Proverbs 1, How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? Proverbs 18, 15. An intelligent heart acquires knowledge. And the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. Far from running from knowledge. We ought to be running to it. We ought to pursue it. In fact, that ought to be known what we're known for. That ought to be what we're known for and what we're known by. 
as individuals who seek truth, beauty, and goodness to the glory of God and for its sake alone. But, remember, this is about the limits of wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge alone can lead to despair. Verses 14 and 15 in our text. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. He recognizes that wisdom and knowledge have their limits. He's tried, but he's failed to be fulfilled by wisdom and knowledge alone because no one can ever be fulfilled by wisdom and knowledge alone. This is the mistake that the atheist makes. The atheist argues that there is no God and that that's okay because we have everything we need through wisdom and knowledge and, and scientific discovery. But we cannot solve every problem. That's what the author means when he says, what is crooked cannot be made straight and what is lacking cannot be counted. No matter how smart we are, we always come up against problems that we cannot solve. And utopia is not coming. With all of our wisdom and with all of our gadgets and with all of our technology, this generation is among the most miserable that the world has ever known. It amazes me that children and ages gone by had none of the gadgets that children today have and yet they found ways to entertain themselves. And children today are constantly saying, I am bored. Amen, somebody. They've got everything. All the gadgets you can imagine. And they say, I am bored. I can, re I can remember, some of the people in the room can remember when television meant you sit down and you watch what's on amen and you watch what was on two or three channels that's all now there are streaming services that literally have thousands upon thousands of things that you can watch and we sit down in front of them and we say nothing's on this is his point this is his point. By itself, wisdom and knowledge just lead to despair because there are limits to human wisdom and knowledge. We learned that a couple of years ago. All it took was a little microscopic bug and it derailed the global economy. Amen? We didn't know what to do with ourselves. We were running around scared, afraid because of a little microscopic bug. By the way, the microscopic bug is still around and it's not going anywhere. Why? Because in all of our sophisticated wisdom and knowledge, we still don't know how to get rid of a virus. What is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. There are limits to human wisdom and knowledge. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 20, one of my favorite passages of scripture. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God, for it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. That's why it leads to despair. Jesus was not speaking particularly about wisdom or knowledge. 
in Matthew chapter 8. But his words, his words ring true even here. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? He's speaking there, we know, about money. But you can also apply that to wisdom and knowledge. You will never be wise enough to defeat death. You will never have enough knowledge to defeat death. Thirdly, knowledge is insufficient without the knowledge of God. Knowledge is insufficient without the knowledge of God. And it will always be insufficient without the knowledge of God. Which is why knowledge alone leads to despair. Look at verses 16 through 18. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this also is but striving after wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. In much wisdom is vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow sorrow is this not true the more we learn the more we realize we don't know you know it, it's 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 one thing for for example um a, a person to to die when we have no idea what is going on with them or no idea how to help them but but it bothers medical professionals when someone comes in and with all of their training and with all of their experience and with all of their knowledge, they do, and we hear it, right? We did everything we could. And yet, it wasn't enough. This is Solomon's thesis in Proverbs, the idea that knowledge is insufficient without the knowledge of God. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Amen? Fools despise wisdom and instruction. There's also clearly in scripture the idea that there is wisdom that is wicked there's wisdom that is wicked it, it's amazing that we split the atom and on the one hand we split the atom and it has given us an amazing abundant clean almost endless source of energy known as nuclear energy it's the cleanest most abundant energy that there is. And yet, in splitting the atom, we also got the most destructive weapon that the world has ever seen. Knowledge doesn't just come in a vacuum. James 3, 13 to 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, 
open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. There is wisdom from above, but there is also earthly wisdom. There is also, as James says, demonic wisdom. That is why our wisdom and our knowledge are always insufficient apart from the knowledge of God. And at the end of the day, that knowledge of God is more specific in that it is the knowledge of his son, Jesus Christ. Paul says it this way in Colossians 1 through 3, Colossians 2, 1 through 3. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. Why wouldn't they be? Why wouldn't they be? He, he is indeed the God-man who spoke the world into existence. He is indeed the savior of the world. He is indeed wisdom from God, the wisdom of God, the very word of God is who Christ is. How could we ever hope to have any true wisdom apart from Christ in whom all wisdom is hidden? No wonder our knowledge and our wisdom are limited. This is why at the end of the day, we absolutely pursue wisdom and knowledge. But we pursue wisdom and knowledge to the glory of God, recognizing that apart from God, our wisdom and our knowledge will lead us to despair because all it will ever teach us is that we can't know enough. We can't be wise enough. We can't be smart enough. We can't invent enough. We can't discover enough. Because what is crooked will never be made straight. And what is lacking will never be counted. And in our quest to have all knowledge, when we realize that we can't, we are left with despair. Unless and until we recognize that the true end of knowledge is the knowledge of God through the person and work of Jesus Christ. It is only then that our knowledge is sufficient. It is only then that our knowledge and our wisdom are put to proper use and toward right ends. And it is only then that we can ever find satisfaction. Only in Christ. Are you walking in despair because things are not working the way you think they ought to work? Or are you walking in despair because you turned wisdom literature into law and you're living your life as though there's some guarantee that if you do A, B, C, you will be guaranteed X, Y, Z, and it hasn't worked out. And you're shaking your fists at God or you're looking inwardly to find out what you did wrong because you didn't get what you expected. That is despair. And it is the despair that always comes when you turn wisdom into law instead of recognizing that the fullness of wisdom is found only in Christ only in Christ. See, if I turn wisdom into law 
and I do what I'm supposed to do and I don't get the right result, I don't have an answer. I don't know what went wrong. But if Christ is the end of all witness, of wisdom, and if God is the sovereign Lord of the universe, I pursue wisdom and knowledge to the glory of God, and it becomes an end in itself, not a means to an end. And I'm satisfied in God and in the wisdom that I've pursued so that even when things don't go the way I desire for them to go, I still know that God is on his throne and that he is enough. And there's the key. Are you pursuing wisdom so that you can get stuff? Or are you pursuing wisdom so that you can know God? One of those will never satisfy you. One of those will never fail to satisfy you.